Uh, well, actually, I was interested. I was watching uh, a performance of the Struts. Uh, it was a concert on YouTube the other night, and one thing that struck me, I was wondering how much of a how much are the Stones an influence on this band? Uh, pretty big, I'd say. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. when uh, me and Luke first started the band, that was like one of the bands that we bonded over, really. And um, yeah, I mean, I mean, me personally, like Keith Richards is one of my favorite guitar players. Yeah. all time so um uh, yeah we we love the stones so. well, well keith does most of the sort of rhythm work in the stones is it? Uh, he's not the lead player of uh yeah not, are you into all that open g tuning and stuff like that yeah i just think he's just a riff king i think he's just uh i love the open g and uh, you know the da, 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 and all that stuff it's uh something i've borrowed definitely in my guitar playing anyway um I think it's a really unique style and I think, I mean, so many riffs, so many great riffs. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, as a one guitar band, I kind of have to juggle playing lead and rhythm at the same time. So, you know, majority of the time I'm playing rhythm guitar and trying to make it as interesting as possible without it, you know, just being power chords. So I think there's something really melodic in the way that Keith plays rhythm guitar, which I like personally. What's your What's your favorite riff? One of my favorites is. Uh, do you know the song "Hand of Fate" from the Black and Blue album? I don't actually know. I love that no. song, but, but also I would oh, use, oh. I'd say the whole of Exile on Main Street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I love I love the riff in Happy. I think Jumping Jack Flash. I mean, uh, bitch. Uh, yeah. I mean, Satisfaction is probably one of the simplest riffs ever written, but it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Um, can't hear me knocking. Like, there's so many. Yeah. What was it like? Uh, what was it like opening for them? Oh, it was an honor. It was, uh, yeah, and, which is weird because next year it'll be 10 years since we first opened up to them, which is, and that kind of is what changed our kind of trajectory in our career, really. Um, that show, um, but it was it, you know it was a true honor, and we we've got to do it another two times since then. So, um, and it was great because we'd never seen the Stones live before. So the first time getting to open up with them and then get to watch the show with our family and stuff was was really cool. Yeah, better. Do you get did you get to chill with him? Did you get to speak to Keith Richards? Yeah, we, yeah, I did. Um, first time it was more like a. Um, a meet and greet situation. So it was like a hello. And we managed to talk to Mick the first time he came over and we watched the sound check and we had a little chat with him. And honestly, though, when it's like, when you get that starstruck, it's just, you don't really remember what you said or what they said. It was just kind of, I think I remember being in the Star de France in Paris going like, oh, there should be a lot of people here tonight. And it's like, oh gosh, why, why did I say that? <laughs> Um, but the second time was, it was funny. It was, uh, Mick came in the room and was like, hello, Strats. And, I, <laughs> you know, I, I got to shake Keith's hand again. And I just said, you know, I'm, I'm the guitar player in the band. And I just want to say, you're a huge influence. And he just said a cigarette. He was, we all got to do something, mate. And I was like, that's, <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> and he was lovely, you know. And, uh, yeah, and I don't really remember. It was the same thing. We had a conversation about guitars, but it was just, I'm just like, <laughs> you know, um, but it was great. And, uh, and I think you know, a lot, we've done a lot of support gigs and some of them, you can tell that they're just waiting for you to finish so they can watch you, you know, really come to see. And yeah. we never had that with them. It was always like, oh, wow, it feels like it's our crowd. Really. It was, um, I guess, because we're kind of similar in play, but same from the same hymn sheet, so. Yeah, well, interesting. Uh, Roger Goodgroves has described Luke as the musical love child of Freddie Mercury and Mick Jagger. To what extent would you agree with that? <laughs> I'd I'd agree to a certain extent. You know, I think he's an amazing front man. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I and I think both Freddie and Mick are great front men, and um, he's got a powerful voice like Freddie. But I think one thing I always thought about: everyone compares Luke to Freddie especially when he had the dark hair. Um, but I always thought Luke's voice was more like Noddy Holder, and that's when, I, when we first met. We, you know, I remember 
we were in my garage and I was like, can you sing Far, Far Away? And I started playing it on the acoustic and then he sang it. And I was like, how do you sing that high? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I, 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 two front men to be compared to, it's, that's a pretty good two to, to be, you know, mentioned within. So I'd agree. Yeah, I suppose that. I mean, um, uh, I've written. I don't know if this is correct. I've written it down that you were actually on the Virgin EMI label. Apparently, they kind of took over your f uh, previous label. Did was it Virg was it Virgin EMI that actually dropped the band? Have I got that correct? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, because we're not. That was a long time ago. Now that was. Um... But they regret it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I yeah, it was. They they put our first album out in 2014. Um, and was that called Everybody Wants? I guess it was. Because um, we re-released it in America. Um, but they put our album out and they just didn't promote it. And we were kind of only on the label anyway because of a, you know, an underhand deal that got management did with another band that they were managing at the time as well. Um, so we, it wasn't like bad or anything like that. They were very gracious and gave us our masters back so we could use those songs with another record label. So there was no bad blood. And honestly, we were just happy to get out of it because we were on Future Records, which was Gary Barlow's label, which then got swallowed by Mercury Records, which then bought by Virgin EMI. So we were just this unwanted child, I think, going through the motions. And in and because of that, and there's no, we, we don't, you know, we don't hate anybody. It was just, it was just, bad circumstances for us so we couldn't release any music until the album came out in 2014 by that point the enthusiasm for us had gone so when we could get the songs back and go and get signed in america to interscope at the time you know that was a lot of labels wouldn't have done that they would have just dropped us and they would have kept our masters so they, it was very kind of them that they gave us back but yeah, yeah that was 20 2014 we got dropped yeah, yeah. Uh, well, one of my favourite bands is actually um, uh, actually Marillion, and uh, they were dropped by EMI as well. So it seems there's a, a good pedigree of bands <laughs> that done really well after being dropped by EMI. Um, <laughs> oh, curiously, you know, um, I know Luke sang on the Mike Oldfield album. I think it was Man on the Rocks. Did, were you involved with that at all? No, no, I wasn't involved. Um, oh. I was just a. Uh... I just I watched on from afar, <laughs> but I think yeah, I mean that was, yeah, that was a while ago as well. But um, no, I thought that was really good. I thought it was a good album. Is progressive rock something that's ever featured on your radar? Not really. Um, I can appreciate it, but it's just I wouldn't probably not been my thing really. Sure, sure. Your influences certainly seem more sort of stones and faces and things like that to to my mind. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we like, um, yeah, like, I think bands that had that pop sensibility and a good, you know, not that prog, it's not, it's like, I think with a lot of progressive rock, it's, um, you know, I kind of like a formulaic good song, like choruses and great melodies and anything, you know, nine minute songs, like, it's hard to keep my attention. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some early Queen stuff was a, a little bit proggy, wasn't it? Oh, definitely, like Queen One and stuff yeah. like that. But, um, but that was, you know, Luke loves that stuff. I'm more of the, you know, Night at the Opera and uh, the more poppier kind of stuff. Yeah, News yeah. of the World is probably my favourite as well. Yeah, it's a great album. I was going to ask you actually, how did you get along with uh, Axel Rose? Because I've heard he can be a bit tricky. And uh, so, what was it like on the Guns N' Roses tour? Well, we actually, we only did one show and we didn't meet him. So, uh, <laughs> so you got so him brilliant. Was, yeah, he's a lovely guy. Uh, <laughs> but it was, um, no, that was a weird one. We played on like a, a Friday. It was a Friday in San Francisco and we were on at six o'clock in the evening. So, playing to a probably like a quarter full stadium by the mm -hmm. end of our set it filled it filled up but it was a uh, it looks good on paper yeah, <laughs> but absolutely. the show it was a bit strange <laughs> yeah would you consider this band uh, a kind of an heir to the the kind of glam rock period in the uk 
Uh, I wouldn't say an heir to it. I think it's something that we admire and take influence from a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but between the four of us in the band, we've all got very eclectic music tastes and we kind of all stumble, like the certain bands that we all agree upon. But then there's, not that we don't like each other's taste, but more people are, like, for example, I like, one of my favorite bands growing up was Green Day. So it's like, but you wouldn't associate that kind of music probably with the struts. But, um, yeah. but then, you know, Jed is like the killers and then like guess like Arctic Monkeys, like more modern stuff. And then, but we all kind of, we, we all like Queen, we all like the Stones, we like the Beatles and T-Rex and Slade and yeah. Uh, Oasis is another one that we all, we all love. And, um, so it's, it, it's, it's really broad. And, and then like Luke's obsessed with meatloaf and, um, who, who we all like too, but it's like, you know, he'll play that all the time. I'll be playing this, other stuff. So it's a real good melting pot of influences. Yeah, American Idiot by Green Day is a, a terrific record. Uh, um, you got to meet Billy Joe, Billy Joe there from Green Day, didn't you? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, actually, a few times now, and um, that was yeah. It's, we we got to open for them in Spain, uh, 2019, which was you know a bit of a dream come true for me because that was the band that got me into like music, really. nice. well, rock music anyway. Um, but yeah, American Idiot's amazing. But yeah, meeting Billy Joe and you know, being able to talk to him and, you know, we exchange numbers and like we've, we've chatted and it's just very, very bizarre because it is, you know, he was my hero growing up. So to have that kind of relationship with somebody like that is a, it's a real honor and uh, yeah, just really cool. <laughs> well, they say, uh, don't meet your heroes. Uh, would you agree with that? <laughs> yeah. I, I disagree with that because, you know, I've, I, I'd say like, I've never met Noel Gallagher, but I've met Liam Gallagher, who's another like hero of mine. Mm -hmm. He was lovely, who notoriously you think wouldn't be. And Billy Joe and Keith Richards and Brian May and I sound like a name dropping, but it's just I'm so, all these people have been so lovely. And I've not really met anyone that I really admire and thought, oh, he's a bit of a dick. <laughs> Everyone's been really gracious. And I think I th I do think this testament to the the success is being a good person as well, because I think that's what gets people want to work with you if you're a good person. And I think that, um, I think there's, there's no coincidence there with that. I think in my experience anyway. <laughs> okay. In interestingly, Joe Elliott described you as one of the most interesting young bands in rock. Uh, how do you feel about that? I think it's amazing. Yeah. He's been a real champion of us uh, from like the early days when we were, getting dropped from Virgin EMI. So um, I think that's awesome. And yeah, having someone like him champion a band like us is, is great. And, um, you know, we worked together on the well, and I've never actually met him, but we've collaborated on a song on our last album. So that was, that was cool over the power of the internet, um, him and Phil, but uh, he's just a lovely bloke. And uh, Brilliant. I think, uh, what, and we, they, they, similar kind of thing because they weren't big in England and then they went to America and got big there. And it's kind of the same. We're doing the same kind of thing. We're definitely bigger in America than we are back in England. Mm -hmm. um, you got quite big in France first, though, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. That was because no one played us on the radio in England. And still, a lot of people don't, apart from Planet Rock and thanks to Joe. Um, but it was We FM that started playing our songs and then we just toured there. Uh, for like 2013, 2014, and we had fans. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. we'd turn up to Bordeaux and, you know, it was a 200 cat venue, but we'd sell it out. We'd like, oh my God, we'd, we'd play Leamington Spa to my brother and his three mates <laughs> and the sound man. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it was, it was cool. One of my subscribers has asked, um, which strut song has your favorite guitar work? Um, there's one on the new album that's not out, which I'd probably say that one, but obviously no one's heard that. Um, Sport for choice. Uh, 
Okay, I'd say like my favorite solo that I've done was probably in the song Ashes mm -hmm. and maybe Fire as well. And then, but I really like the riff for Dirty Sex and Money. I was pretty happy when that one came along. Um, so for different reasons, I'd say probably those three. I'm also blanking what songs we've got. Because <laughs> uh, some of them are pretty simple and straightforward, but I think Dirty Sex and Money is a, you know, without tooting my own horn, I think that's a good riff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm I'm proud of that one, and uh, and I like the solos on Fire and Ashes. I think they're uh, they're nice and melodic, and I, I was pretty chuffed with those ones. Okay, how did Strange Days come about? I mean, is Strange Days um, uh, one of those lockdown now? There's lots of lockdown albums. I mean, McCartney did mm. one, Foo Fighters. I think they're they're um, coming from the title of the last album. It's a great record, very sort of funk and disco inspired. Oh yeah, yeah, the Bee Gees one. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember like the a... title of it though. Uh, I've gone from my head. I, I can't. Um, anyway, it's uh, so there's a lot of these lock this subgenre called lockdown albums. Is Strange Days one of those albums? Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, it was. Um... Is the title obviously indicative of we were in amid strange days? It's not a Doors reference or anything. No, no, no. Um... Originally, the, we, we'd been writing songs for the album that's going to come out this year, and we kind of just hit pause, and we were going to go write like two or three songs for an EP, um, and we all got COVID because this was like April 2020, so this was really early. So we all got COVID tests, and then went to the producer's house in LA called John Levine, and we just thought, right, let's just write some songs, and then we, in six days, we'd written nine songs, and and recorded most of it as well. Most of it is recorded track live. And uh, the 10th the song was a cover. Um, but we we only in, intended to do like two or three songs, but we just kept on going. We're like, oh my God, this is, you know, and I think you can hear that in some of the songwriting. It's like, I'd say, I think if we had taken more time, maybe we could have made the songs better and stuff. But um, yeah, it, it, we were there for 10 days and we'd done yeah 10 songs and then we went back for like two more days to finish the vocals and, the, and like a few guitar overdubs mm -hmm. um but yeah and all this all every, luke had a load of lyrics and i had a load of riffs and then we just yeah it was crazy we did the whole thing in 10 days and obviously strange days because it was strange days and then the features on it was because we knew everyone else was sat at home doing nothing so mm. we could just call them up and be like hey do you want to be on this song and every, you know luckily everyone said yes and uh yeah it, it was just fun and and random you know we've got robbie williams and we've got tom morello I mean, yeah very different <laughs> absolutely yeah um i wonder how do you feel about the state of rock and roll is gene simmons right when he says rock is dead i know i think it's i i think that's wrong i think if anything it's in the best state it's been in since probably like 2007. yeah, yeah you yeah. know after like the arctic monkeys libertines and then he had the green day michael walker romance emo -y thing kind of going on i think there I suppose there was other indie bands and stuff like that. But I think, especially when we were around like the 2010s to 2000, and, I don't know, 2016 was, it was out of it. But I think now because of streaming, um, it might not be in the charts, rock music, you know, like the Hot 100 or whatever. But I think now more than ever, there's more guitar bands. And I think maybe that was because of COVID, you know, everyone picked up the guitars more. And bands like Man of Skin breaking through, um, you know, obviously Greta Van Fleet, have, uh, others than Greta Van Fleet, I guess, you know, kind of been leading that charge. But a lot of pop artists are now using guitars, so I think it's guitars are cool, are cool again, which they, have, which I always thought they were, obviously. But like in the mainstream, I think. Well, Britpop um, was very guitar based, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely. It's just I think. In, the last eight or so years it'd been gone gone away for a bit but um i think now more than ever it's i think rock's back really yeah 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 um what was the inspiration for the song falling falling for me um that was basically just as well mainly you know luke it was him 
we wrote the song together, but um, it was about him kind of going, well, I mean, we were all going out really, and, you know, on the Sunset Strip and the Rainbow Bar and Grill, which is famous oh, on Sunset famous. Strip. Yeah, yeah. So we'd go there a lot and uh, Luke was seeing a girl at the time and a lot of the lyrics, they'd go to the Rainbow and they'd, um, a lot of the lyrics were inspired from their like, little relationship that they had at the time. Um, but it's just kind of one of those fun songs about going out in the nightlife in LA and, you know, for us being from England and stuff like that. And, well, and Wales, guess Welsh. Um, from the UK, it's yeah. uh, it was cool to, um, you know, experience that. And, we've, you know, we've been going out in LA for a while, but we'd moved to LA at that point. So it was just all the trappings of going out and having some fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was uh, what was it like working with uh, Jason D'Souza as a producer? It was great. Yeah, like he's a, he was a great guy, and we worked with him a lot on this album as well. We actually ended up producing it ourselves with Julian Rain and the rest of the record. But um, we wrote some songs with him. But um, he's a uh, he's a great guy and a, a really talented, and it, he really pushed our, pushed us into things that we probably wouldn't have naturally gone for which was cool like um like originally at the falling um the the weird lead line was something i came up with and then instinctively i wanted to make it really rocky and but he was like no it should be more like lo-fi and more cool and like subdued so taking us out of comfort zone was really cool and um, mm-hmm. experimenting with different things that we hadn't done before. So, no, it was great and he's a great friend as well. Um, one of my subscribers asks, uh, I hear a huge difference between the struts in the studio and the struts live. Is this intentional? If so, what are you trying to achieve in the two different arenas? Um, I think, yeah, I, mean, I don't know if it's in, I guess it is intentional. It's just, when we and Luke started the band, like one thing we really wanted to, uh, we were really conscious of was not sounding like a regurgitation of the past. Yeah, yeah. So we like we loved all those bands, we just didn't want to sound like we we're imitating them. So from the day one, it was always about trying to take those influences but make it sound fresh and exciting. Um, and so like. I mean, I think the third album is pretty, I mean, it's basically live. That's, I, I still think we'd probably rock it up a bit more live because that's just, as a three, like I don't have another guitar player or a piano player on stage. So I'm trying to fill a lot of space. So usually the game comes up in the guitar world. Um, but the first two records definitely was trying to push the envelope, trying to make something fresh and something that was unique to now. I think the album that's going to come out this year is... I think we've done from exper- going one way and then so like the first album being like an experimentation, the second album being like pushing that even further, third one being more like a, a live album. This fourth one is like a good mix of all, all three. So it's probably the rockiest album that we've done, but it's still got those elements which make it sound fresh and exciting and not just sounding like uh, imitating, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, got quite a heavy question for you next, and that is, uh, in terms of popular music, uh, who do you think has had the biggest uh, cultural impact, the Beatles or Elvis Presley? <laughs> it's a stinker, isn't it? You know. <laughs> uh, I think the easy thing... probably to... wouldn't have the Beatles if it wasn't for Elvis. No, but that's exactly the right answer, isn't it? Yeah. So I I guess you'd have to say Elvis. Yeah. Because, yeah, because, but then there's, you know, the Beatles love Little Richard as well. So but then, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. You wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have the Beatles without Elvis, so probably that. <laughs> you know, I'm a, a big fan of James Brown, and um, James Brown described Elvis Presley as a hillbilly that discovered the blues, which I think is excellent, really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
I, I have uh, I have one last question for you. Really, as a guitarist, who is better in your opinion, Hendrix or Beck? Hendrix. Why is that? Uh, I think... I think it, maybe it's a taste thing. I mean, of course it's a taste thing. But it's, for me... I prefer the songs and I think the songs are so unique. Not that Jeff Beck isn't, but it's just for me, it just speaks to me more. And I think his guitar playing speaks to me more. And, and it, kind of what I alluded to earlier is playing that rhythm, but making it sound like a lead guitar in mm -hmm. what Hendrix did really inspires me. Um, and for such a small career, really, you know, three and a half, four years, I think such a, you know, a huge dollop of just music came out. Um, yeah, I'd say that, but you know, it, it's it, that, it's a taste thing, and that's just that's my opinion anyway. And Hendrix was so uh, influential on the burgeoning heavy metal scene that sort of came afterwards as well. I mean, so many people copying his uh, style and, and the way of playing, I think as well. Yeah, and I don't think anyone really heard the guitar sound like that before. Mm -hmm. You know, and like that. It was the showmanship. Marshall Stacks. Yeah, and just, yeah, I mean, he was, a, me and my friend Tim, he, he's a huge Hendrix fan, but he's convinced that he was an alien. <laughs> and he's not of this world. <laughs> and he just said, like, just no one was like him. And no one really ever has been since. And I just think the songwriting is just so phenomenal. And the guitar work on it is just, yeah, insane. I I used to know a guy who was a big Who fan. He used to he, he used to go and see the Who when bands did residencies. You know, it, when the Who used to do a residency, the Marquee, I think it was. And one of the nights they were supported by the Jimi Hendrix experience. So I was always pressing. So what was it like seeing him? But uh, but uh, you know, the Who, they're another great band. I would love to have seen them back in the day. So around about nineteen seventy something. Mm. That live at Leeds album is absolutely incredible. Yeah. Anyway, I'll let you um, get some sleep, get some coffee, maybe, and uh, do enjoy. I've got another interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, yeah, do enjoy this uh, American tour. I'm sure it'd be absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to me. It's much appreciated. All the best, mate. Bye bye. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay. All the best. Bye bye. Bye.